to kind of sit up and make sure you catch it good. But it all makes sense if you if you get it in your head right. <laughs> Let's bow our hearts, Father. Thank you um, for a refreshing night's sleep. And now for a day's work ahead, Lord God, we look forward to it. And we want to start it with you. And we want to start it with one another, Lord God. Entering into this fellowship and the time you've given us to serve you today. So bless our day and our study here this morning and each one that's joining us. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, friends. Now we're coming, uh, and chapter 14 kind of concludes uh, Paul's instructions on spiritual gifts. This is one of the seven issues he was dealing with because as we heard yesterday, this this church was eager on spiritual gifts and gone way over and was not using them in the way that God intended. And it seems if we can catch the inferences, they were all speaking in tongues and doing it, and there was no understanding what was going on. That was just confusion. And you know, catch this. Paul says, you know, God is not the father of confusion. He doesn't like this. So he's going to kind of help them understand the difference between private use of tongues, and sometimes called a prayer language, and then the tongues that is given for a service, which needs to be interpreted. And without that interpretation, then the, prophet, the spirit of the prophet, the prophet himself, the person who's speaking in tongues, doesn't have to give that message unless there's one who can interpret. So it's those instructions. And his emphasis is, of course, on the body of Christ, the church, the local church. He says, this is what it's, you know, the importance of this is. So the lost may have understanding. There's a couple of passages here, as Pastor just said, that are a little complex. And I'll take my shot at them, but it, it's uh, no one you know, probably understands totally what Paul's saying because he's speaking out of that context, but we can take a the guess to what we think he's saying and interpret it, but they're not critical. I mean, the, the inference is so obvious. Don't do this, you know, and so that is all very easy to understand. And so we're almost to the end of 1 Corinthians already. Josh will take us through this great chapter on the resurrection, which is very, very important. So let's begin, verse 1. And remember, we've just come through, like we said, 12, 13, 14, all go together. You know, he introduces spiritual gifts. Then he says, there's a better way. These gifts must be used with love. If they're not used with love, then you're just a bunch of noise. It's not going to really help the body of Christ. But he said, now, I'm going to say, this is how you use these gifts with love. And if you do, the church really benefits from it. And uh, if you're in a true Pentecostal church where the gifts of God move, it's, you know, people go away from church and say, wow, <laughs> this was a great day because we heard from God. God spoke to us. Verse one, pursue love, okay? In other words, like he said that more than once, I showed you a more excellent way. He said at the end of 12, now he says, pursue love. But desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Okay. And once again, he's saying the gifts without love are a bunch of noise. But if you have the gifts with love, then you have, you know, spiritual things, he's saying. You can have a spiritual body. But then he's saying, especially that you may give a prophetic speech. And prophetic speak is speaking for God. And a pastor, I hope, I hope when I speak, I speak prophetically. You want the spirit to be anointing the word of God that you're preaching. Or someone may give a message in, in prophecy. It's speaking forth the word of God. Now in Paul's thinking here, unknown tongues, with interpretation seems to be the same as a gift of prophecy. You know, that, that somehow they have the same effect in the body of Christ. Verse two, for one who speaks in a tongue 
does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. So some people say, well, you don't, you know, just have love. You don't need tongues. No, no, no. You need both. That, that's the, sometimes the people make these incredible statements. When you speak in tongues, you speak mysteries unto God. And you're speaking to God. He says that. And so that's the wonderful thing. And the spirit helps our infirmities when we don't know how to pray. Paul says in Romans 8 that we study. And, but the spirit speaks through you. And speaking the will of God and the, the needs that you may have. So you're speaking mysteries to God. And that's wonderful. But no one, the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. Okay. So a, a word of prophecy that's given in a church gets us three things. It can build up. Edification means that builds up the body of Christ, makes people strong. Exhortation that somehow helps them to understand the will of God, what's going on. And then consolation, if someone is grieving, someone is going through a difficult valley because of a loss or whatever, the spirit of God through that prophetic word is going to help. So how wonderful it is to have these three things going on in the local body to help. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Okay, it doesn't mean you shouldn't speak in tongues. Just means that when you do speak in tongue, you build yourself up. That's why it's wonderful to speak in uh, tongues as a personal experience. For one who prophesies, he edifies the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, okay? Now, here, Paul, he levels the field. When people say, well, you know, as we talked about yesterday, well, you know, in part, you know, the tongues are going to be done away. But they don't read that prophecy is going to be done away. Knowledge is going to be done away. That's when we're with the Lord, obviously, when the kingdom comes, when we're with Jesus. But Paul says, I speak in tongues. You know, I, he says, I want you to do that. Now, once again, verse 5. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. But evermore that you would prophesy, and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive building up, edifying. So if you're going to give a message in tongues, and I hope you do, I hope you move in that direction, then you, you wait for someone that may edify, interpret that, that message of yours, because it will then edify the church, build it up. But now, brethren, I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, gets this, or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or of teaching? Okay, here's four levels. This is what the ministry is all about, what it's going to do for you. And when he says, I, I'm not doing this if I don't interpret this message. But when the message is given, when the pastor preaches, or when someone gives a, a word of prophecy, it should be for revelation something that we don't understand, knowledge to help us, or prophecy, or of teaching. You know, we could stop right there, and you could study a whole lot about this is what the ministry does in the body of Christ. These four things, and it will bless the people. Okay, verse 7. Yet even lifeless things, either a flute or a harp, and producing a sound, if it does not produce a distinction, in the notes, how will we be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? He's just reiterating, giving a, an example of the verse before that. In other words, you don't have one song going all the time. He says that when prophecy or when the pastor and the preaching or people give a word, there's other things. It's just not one note clicking all the time. You know, and there's a revelation or there's uh, a prophecy or there's a teaching going on to bless the body of Christ. And so we need that. For if the bugle produces a indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Not going to happen. Okay, verse 8, verse 9. So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. 
Once again, he's reiterating, it's just a sound like a harp or, or a something else with one tone going all the time. So obviously this church, they were coming together and they were all speaking in tongues and no one was interpreting. And so there was confusion. So, so Paul's saying, that's not the will of God. God wants people to be built up and understand. So you don't just have one gift in operation. And, and it has to be interpreted, not just tongues without interpretation. Now, once again, I'm just saying that's not a prayer language. That's not the, the tongues that you would have in your private life. This is for tongues that would be given as a message for the local church that needs to be interpreted. Uh, 10, there are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world and no kind without meaning. Okay, so he says, if there's language, there's some meaning going on going, and so we got to know what the meaning is. Then if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be the one who speaks like a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. Barbarian is not, not necessarily a bad term. It just means someone who doesn't understand the language, just someone who can't do this. So he's saying, don't give a message in tongue unless there's someone there that can interpret the tongue. And then he said, if there's no one that can interpret the tongue, he says, pray that you may interpret. You can have that gift also. My personal feeling when I was pastoring, I always felt better when someone would give a message in tongues and another person would interpret that. If the same person interprets, that's okay. But I don't think, to me, it's not as valuable as someone else doing it. Or else, why don't you just prophesy? Because that would be the same thing. But that's just a personal preference. Paul is not saying that. Verse 12. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, or to be spiritual, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Here's a conclusion. Everything we're doing is for the local church to build up the body. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret it. Yeah, you can have that gift also. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit. There's a great verse. I shall pray with the spirit and I shall pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Okay, so Paul's saying, you know, people can sing in an unknown tongue. I, I And one of my trips into Mongolia, we were having a revival meeting, and I told us we were in, in doing some preparation for an evangelistic outreach. And these people desire spiritual gifts. I mean, it was amazing. You know, Mongolian people are really sharp. That's why Genghis Khan, you know, <laughs> conquered two-thirds of the known world. He was very, very bright. And so they're very, very... The Japanese have work on Nishin, very earnest, just trying to do things. So I said, well, let's, you know, we've been praying in tongues. Let's sing in tongues. And we can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I said, we can do that. Paul says we can do that. <laughs> and that's a marvelous song. I've gone into services, even when I was a kid, when the whole service was people singing in an unknown language. Nothing wrong with that. That wasn't to be edified. I mean, that wasn't to be interpreted to be edified the church. That was speaking praises unto God. That's okay. But it's not something you do all the time, as we'll see in a moment. What is the outcome then? I shall pray in the spirit. I shall pray with the mind also. Okay, 16. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen? At your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you're saying, right? So you don't, with the, the lost are coming in, if you're just praying in tongues, they don't understand what's going on, and it's confusion. Or if you are giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. So he says, somehow you don't do that when you have a loss, and he's going to kind of explain that, because it can be almost judgment like unto them. But thank God, here's the verse that many... Many theologians skip over when they say, you know, tongues will cease. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. 
<laughs> you know, I'm sure some of the people said that, you know, you're you're stopping us from speaking in tongues, Paul. Who are you to say that? We're very spiritual. We're going to talk in tongues. Paul says, no, no, no. In my private life, I speak in tongues more than all of you guys. I pray with understanding. I pray in the spirit. I sing with understanding. I sing in the spirit. So he's kind of, he's trying to help them understand He's not clipping their wings, so to speak, to keep them from doing spiritual things. He's trying to help them to do spiritual things in the right way for the body of Christ. And Paul is always thinking of the body of Christ. He's thinking of the local church, that the local church may be built up and do its work. The local church is God's part. I will build my church. Verse 19, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct others also than 10,000 words in a tongue, okay? Now, Paul is not saying you don't speak with tongues, like some said. He's just saying it's better to speak to help the body of Christ. Tongues are interpretation or prophesy. So he's just saying, you know, it doesn't do the lost any good. It doesn't do the body of Christ any good unless it's interpreted, unless you're just praying have a time of prayer or something. Okay, verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil, the babes, but in your thinking mature. In other words, grow up, you guys. You're a bunch of turkeys out there. What's wrong with you? This is obvious, he says. You know, you're not helping the body of Christ. And I don't, you know, this is not a problem you have in your church, but he's saying there's churches that have done this and go overboard. And he says, come on, be mature. Verse 21, in the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to the people. And even so that they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, gets this, are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but those who believe. Okay, this is the most difficult verse of this chapter to me. And what's Paul doing? He's saying you're using all kinds of languages and people don't understand what you're saying. And for the law, someone comes into the church and they can't figure out what's going on. It's confusion. In fact, of so much confusion that they may leave. But Paul's also saying something else, and he's quoting a scripture from chapter 28 of Isaiah, verses, you know, 10, 11, 12. In there, he's saying, you know, and, and the prophet is saying, you know, with the stammering lips, he's going to judge people. So this, I think, is almost a judgment. Tongues can be a judgment against the lost. And they may not know what's going on, but it's, it's a sign to them, those who do not believe. And, and so that always kind of bothered me because I thought, well, you know, tongues, you know, their interpretation is for unbelievers. Paul says, no, without the interpretation, it's almost like, you know, they're babbling and it's almost like judgment on them because they don't hear the word of God. And, and the prophet gave this as a judgment on Israel right before they were taken into captivity in Babylon, which they did not understand that language. And so they had that judgment on them for 70 years. So he's saying, this is a sign not to those who believe, not to the body of Christ, but to unbelievers. The prophecy is for a sign, once again, it says God's work, not to unbelievers, but those who believe. So just think that if unbelievers come into the church and there's tongues that are given with no interpretation, it's almost like Israel when they went into captivity in Babylon. They didn't understand what was going on. They didn't know the way of God and they didn't repent because they couldn't understand the message. Okay, verse 23. If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men, ungifted men and non-Christians probably, or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're mad? Yeah, they don't know what's going on. Apparently they were all speaking in tongues and some of the people were coming into the church at Corinth 
And they said, these people are crazy because they didn't know, understand what's going on. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, and the secrets of his heart are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Wow. If the gifts of God are used properly, you can, you can say that God will speak through that tongue or through that prophecy, that's interpreted, excuse me, that will speak to that person who's come in. Now, you say, does that really happen? Yeah, that does happen. Uh, I had worked with a man who was a great pastor when I was very, very young, Dr. Van Cleve. And uh, he did not speak Spanish, but he was down in Latin America and, and the interpreter who was going to interpret his message from English into Spanish did not come. And it was a very needy area. God gave him Spanish. And he spoke even though Afterwards, he couldn't speak again. And the whole place fell down on their knees because God spoke through him. It was not, not intelligible to him, but he spoke in a language that they understood. And God knew what they needed to know, that they would repent. Um, I wish that happened every time, <laughs> but it doesn't. You know, We have to learn languages, but I'm just saying, God knows. And when you have a person who gets a word of prophecy, that that word of prophecy may check the heart, may catch the need in the heart of someone, an exhortation or a revelation or something, or it may reveal an area of sin in that person's life. And the person who gives the prophecy doesn't know that God's speaking through them to that particular need, but he may, he may not. But I'm just saying God can use these gifts to help people repent of their sins. You know, the spirit comes to what? To convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Catch that. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the judgment part we don't like, but God does that. And that's why I think, unknown, un, you know, tongues may do it at times, although people do not know what's going on. But I'm just saying, you know, the spirit uses the gifts in the body of Christ. And God is ministering to the needs of the people there. And you may be there, and all of a sudden, a word of tongues or our interpretation comes, and all of a sudden, it encourages you and gives you just the peace that you need and helps you through a difficulty or trial that you're in. So that's what the gifts are supposed to do. That's why they operate in the church. My concern, I don't think they're operating in as many churches in America as they used to. When, well, let's go on. We're going to see this, and we'll, we'll come to that. If I don't do this, we'll all run out of time. <laughs> what is the outcome then, therefore? When you assemble each one and catch this, this is a marvelous verse. Each one has a psalm. You know, you may have a psalm that you want to give. It may be something that would encourage someone. Or it has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. What a marvelous, marvelous help in the local church. Okay, so, you know, you may, when God may quicken you, and there may be a, a psalm that, and there a part of a psalm that you would give as a word of prophecy or just speak to encourage the church, the body of Christ. Or you may give a message in tongues or, or whatever it is, an interpretation. But everything must be done to edify the body of Christ. That's, that's his general statement. He says it over and over again. If we're not doing that. Then we're not using spiritual gifts properly. Then he gives some correction. And this is something the pastor has to really be cognizant of. You know, if one speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at most three. And each one in turn, let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay, this is instruction. Um, you've been 
pastor in church when sometimes you, you get two or three messages and someone wants to give another message. Hey, I think I, I would stop that. I said, no, Paul gets very clear that the purpose is to, at the most three, message in tongues that it to be interpreted because all of a sudden it's moving beyond the realm. And if God gives you, there'd been three messages in tongues and interpretation and God gives you where you speak to yourself, you know, let it edify yourself because Paul's going to say why we do this. But if there's no interpreter, then keep silent in the church and then speak to himself and to God. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So edify yourself and let it, two or three speak and let other pass judgment. Catch that. Even a message in tongue has to fit the, the scripture and it can't go outside the realm of the scripture. You know, someone may get excited and say something that's off the wall or something they read. Well, you listen and you figure out in judgment and it's up to the pastor and to the board or the leaders of the church saying, whoa, hold on a little bit. Someone's given a message to sell, we're to sell our church this week. Well, I think you need to have judgment. <laughs> you know, let's, let's look at this a little bit, guys. Well, no, I'm speaking for God. Well, you may be, you think you are, but we got to know if that's the word of God. It's not us, we're going to accept everything point blank. You know, we got to figure out if this is God's will for us, okay? So that doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. And I've been in churches when it's happened. And, and I've been in leadership when it happened. So you have to, you have to kind of judge it. You know, that's okay. We're not saying, you know, a person's bad or anything like that. Okay, uh, verse 30. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, let him first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that one may learn and all be exhorted. And the spirit of the prophets, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Okay. In other words, you're not out of control. You're not in a trance. You're not somewhere skipping. You know, you may not have understanding, but you do things in the spirit with the spiritual mind. So, you know, if, if people are saying, well, no, this is from God, all this. No, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. If you're going to give a message, and or if you're going to give a message in tongue interpretation, there's already been three. You just hold on. Don't do that. You know you know what you would not do. Not you guys. I'm saying of the church in lines. So I think it's because sometimes people get kind of excited and they want to jump in also. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Wow. Great instruction for the local church. God is a God of peace. He doesn't want a lot of things going on and no one understanding. And when the lost people come in and says, you guys are mad, that's what he's saying, because we don't understand what's going on. I'm not speaking to your church. I'm just talking about the church in general, okay? Okay, now we're going to come to some tough areas. And this is one of those areas that uh, some parts of the body of Christ jump on. And, and uh, I'm going to interpret some of this stuff a little bit culturally, because I think that's what it is. You know, Rick Warren, who has a huge church, in Southern California, I've been there, uh, and he they have spiritual gifts operating in that church. He was Southern Baptist, but he ordained women, and and they just recently, well, it's been a few months back, they picked him out of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is sad. And so they left, but the reason that they were ordaining women for ministry, and. The Southern Baptists hold on to that women should not be ordained or in leadership. Maybe this was at that time because culturally, you know, that was not something that was acceptable. But I mean, when women can be the president of the United States, when women can be head of Congress, and women can hold any position a man holds, maybe we can say this is a little bit different world than that was in the first century. 
This is something you can interpret yourself. But let me read it. Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but let them themselves subject themselves just as the law also says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth? Or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, in other words, person who has spiritual gifts, let him recognize that these things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if one does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but let all things be done properly and in an orderly manner. Okay. That's where he's coming to. Now, this, this part, I think probably in that day, women did not have the, the opportunity to hold positions of leadership. Maybe a few like in Egypt and places like that, but it wasn't normal in the Jewish world. So probably, I think, I think with the advance of education and women taking more and more leadership, I would walk a little softly here. And if a person kind of thinks that way, I think it's okay, but you shouldn't say it can't happen to other people. You could hold it in your own way. I, I think it's wrong. I think it's chauvinistic, and I don't think that's right. The body of Christ, women can lead, and I think they should lead. And in the churches I pastored, I had women helping me. And in your church, that happens. So all of you ladies here have spiritual gifts and, and work in the church. So... Uh, there are some parts of the body of Christ that do not hold to this. They kind of emphasize this part. And, and we were in a few chapters back, and Scott dealt with this. So I'm not going to land on it too hard. But I'm just saying, I think that this is a, a culturally speaking, he's saying in that day, it was not acceptable because women probably did not have this as experience. But I think things have changed. And Paul has said many, many times there's no difference between Jew or Gentile, male or female, barbarian, Scythian or Jews. I mean, it's all. So I, I think he's somehow speaking into that context of that church in Corinth. Okay, maybe I'll open a can of worms and you can talk about it in the breakout section. Okay, I'll stop there and let you guys speak. Okay. Go ahead. This, uh... Yeah, this this was interesting for me too when I first read it. And there's that that little bit on on women is it's only two verses out of the 39 that are this chapter. But that seems to catch a lot of people's attention and be a stopping point for a lot of people to understand what this chapter is saying and it's a good truth god isn't chaotic he doesn't do things randomly and just throw out his love like we're playing cornhole he doesn't just he doesn't just go crazy with it he's he's smart and he's orderly and wise with how he gifts and how he wants us to conduct our own lives. And it's cool to see. We have an insight of who God is and how he wants us to be with this. And so the, the cultural times that this is fit into doesn't necessarily fit where we are right now. A lot of the stuff on spiritual gifts and how to deal with that doesn't apply to this church at this moment either. We have to take what this is saying, bring it into our context and understand that, oh, this is talking about order. This is talking about a God who loves order in all things. And it's been a blast to work with my dad because he keeps things very orderly, very structured. And you want to be under someone and serve with someone who's orderly. It's so pleasing to work with someone who's orderly and who sets things in order 
when you come together, when you gather, it's just feels so trustworthy. You're more ready to trust that person. You're more ready, more ready to trust what's happening. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate here is that order is good in all things. It's fantastic in all things. Even in this mis a lot of misunderstood things of the times, of spirituality, of the spirit moving. And so, yeah, let's have order in more than our just lives. It's convicting because for us personally, because it moves beyond just the church and it moves beyond the structure here. It moves into our own lives to say we should be orderly with our lives, with all that God has given us to the, the structure of how we live, our finances, our relationships. There sh it shouldn't just be wild. It should be orderly. And that's a beautiful thing. And I hear that all the time from, from my sisters who are like, you gotta, come on, get it together, man. You gotta, you gotta pick your outfits. You gotta plan your finances. You gotta, you gotta do this. And I'm just like, eh, but waiting this, it's convicting. We have to be orderly in what we do with our lives, how we are stewards of our lives. So this extends to more than just the church. And we can lose sight of the fact that this moves beyond the church and into our own lives personally if we just take specific verses and read those. Da. Okay. <clears throat> Great job bringing us through this verse by verse, Bob. Really enjoyed it. And uh, Josh, with the emphasis on order. And so if we were to do a devotion on uh, a totally on the topic of how do you handle your finances when you when they your finances have gone over ten million dollars. And I would spend a whole half an hour teaching you, what do you do when you hit $10 million in your personal finances? You'd be sitting there thinking, uh, I don't like, I don't have $10 million, but probably won't. Like this is kind of not applying to my life right now. Can we change the subject? And we have a little bit of that here that this is not our problem typically in today's world. Now, it might be in some microcosm churches, um, but generally speaking, we're not overflowing and overdoing the gifts of the Spirit, walking in the gift of miracles, the gift of healing, the gift, and just praying for people and speaking in tongues so much that we have to be corrected, prophesying so much that we have to say, look at only two or three of you, one at a time now, come on now, and, and calm down here. I've had that in other countries, but I haven't, I don't really have that as a pastor here in New England. And so we're going through a chapter today, and I thank you for your patience. But the point, I guess, is we've gone through the book of Acts, and God is handing out $10 million to each of us and saying, you could be filled with the Spirit, and you could walk in the gifts. But until you really want that, and you're, you're going to handle that, this passage isn't going to be as relevant as God might like it to be to us. So, Paul, as Bob has said so well, um, this is about strengthening the church that's the primary focus of our lives to strengthen the community of believers it's for edification and it's in everything that's done in the church what we do in the churches needs to be intelligible it needs to be understood and understand we need to bring things that people could understand so just randomly speaking in tongues if i was a pastor here standing in the pulpit just speaking in tongues that would be highly obnoxious because it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to understand it. You wouldn't even know when I'm coming to a conclusion. You wouldn't know anything. And so Paul's saying, look, speak a few words in English rather than uh, 10,000 with, with another tongue. When you're talking to people, edify the body, understand who they are. And so 
I would say reading this chapter today, what God would have us receive is, is to ask us the question, are you walking in the spiritual gifts? Are you walking, are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? And so maybe instead of putting the brakes on, like Paul's doing here for the Corinthian church, um, he, he wants to pour a little gasoline on the fire and say, come on, let's fan this flame. Let's fan this little flicker into a flame and let's let's move you into that. And, and that's true for other parts of scripture too. When, you know, it's talking about a church who, who has to go to a guy who's sleeping with his father's wife. We don't have that problem either. What we do is we take those situations and translate it into our own and say, okay, God, what are you saying to us through this, through this situation? And the other thing I just want to bring up is this verse 34, which, um, you know, people trip over quite commonly about women. And so if you, if you listen to this, we're reading this chapter and these three chapters about the gifts, about love about building up the community. And women um, so far are 100% involved. Women, he says, uh, all of you should speak in tongues. Women, men, everyone, prophesy. Seek to prophesy. He's talking to women too. And all through this, the gifts of the spirit are for women. And so we're reading all this on building up the church and keeping it in order. And then all of a sudden we hit this strange bit of road in the scripture. All of a sudden he pops out with this, let the women keep silent in the churches. Now that doesn't go along with speaking in tongues and prophesying and all the rest, for they are not permitted to speak. Well, let them subject themselves just as the law also says. Now, wait a minute. Are we going back to the law here? <laughs> We're free from the law. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home for it's improper for a woman to speak in the church. So I'm going to, you know, um, I enjoy um, Dr. Gordon Fee. And he got his um, PhD and he did his dissertation on the manuscript 66. Uh, in other words, and, and I, I don't want to go crazy with this, but I just want to give you some background here. We have the Bible, and this Bible came from translators. The Bible wasn't written in English. And those translators translated the Greek, let's say the New Testament, into English. But before they could translate it into English, into English from the Greek, they had to decide what is the actual Greek text. So what happens is we don't have the original writings of the Apostle Paul or any of them uh, called the autograph. What we have are copies that the scribes have made from the original. And so the copies have remained what they call extent. They, they are we have copies, but we don't have the original writings of the Apostle Paul or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or all of them. We don't have any of the original markings or writings at all. We have copies. And so we've been discovering manuscripts for a long time now. And when the King James Version was written, we had about a dozen manuscripts. And now we have multiple thousands of manuscripts, copies of the, the autograph. Now, just try to follow me here. What happens was you have copies, and then, of course, you have copies of copies. And you have copies of copies of copies. There was no printing press. The scribes would take a copy of what they had in front of them, and they would copy it. Now, here's where the plot thickens. What a scribe would do was look in the, would, would be reading this and transcribing it, and the scribe would write in the margin a note that they think was pertinent to, they were added their thinking to the, manus, the manuscripts that he's being, that are being copied. So then the next scribe comes along and he's gonna copy this copy, 
that the last scribe did, but now he sees a note on the side. And sometimes that note was put into the text. It's called a gloss. And so we have a whole set of scholars. They're called textual critics. And, and the, the discipline, the science of it is textual criticism. Their whole job is to look at these thousands of Greek manuscripts and put them all together into what they all decide is the Greek manuscript that is the solid, most likely version of what was originally written. And so Dr. Gordon Fee is a textual critic. That's what he got his PhD in. And he took Manual 66, Manuscript 66, and he studied that for his dissertation, like textual critics do. And so what he looked at very deeply in this passage is he looked at what manuscripts have this passage, verse 34 and 35, in it, and which ones didn't and which ones are newer and which ones are older. And so he lists this out and I've read it. It's about 20 pages long, his study of the manuscripts and the time periods and the glosses and all the rest. So his conclusion, his conclusion is that verses 34 and 35 are a gloss. They weren't Paul's originally original writing. And, and I don't say that lightly. And I'm going to let you keep it. We're going to keep it in our Bibles. But um, that's what he says. And he says it makes sense because all of a sudden he's got this issue with women that pops out of nowhere when he's talking about um, tongues and interpretation, prophecy, the gifts of the spirit, which he includes women in all this time. Then all of a sudden, somehow out of the blue, and he thinks it's a scribe that has had this thought himself and just interjects this here. So I'm not qualified to make the determination. There are other scholars who would keep this in, and it is in the translation, the NAS and the NIV. But what it does is it softens my emphasis on this. That I don't have to nail this down and preach it on Sunday morning. Wives, don't say anything. Women, keep silent. I don't have to say that on Sunday morning because this may be a gloss. Doesn't make any difference with the gospel. Doesn't make any difference with the mes message of Christ and the blood of Calvary. We're all saved. But it does make a difference on, on sort of like how the church is supposed to behave and act. So I, I would take 34 and 35 in agreement with Dr. Gordon um, uh, Fee and say, well, I'm going to tread lightly with this verse. Um, this looks like very possibly a gloss to me. So I'm going to be careful with this verse. So, so far, the first challenge we had to women a few verses ago, we easily were able to look at that as a tradition of that time. And Paul uses the word tradition, and he, he moves in that direction there. Here, he's not, he's not doing that if this is Paul. The question I have here is whether this is legitimately written by Paul or not. This is beyond the scope of our capability. We need to rely on textual critics for this. And so one of the most renowned is Gordon Fee, and that's what his opinion is on this. So I'm not saying rip it out of your Bible or anything else. Let's consider it like everybody else. But let's be careful on how much we weight this passage in how we behave in the church. And so I don't use this passage to create church policy and use this scripture to back it up. I don't expect women. And, and so, again, I'm going to read it. Verse 34, let the women keep silent in the churches. I don't require women to keep silent in the churches. Um, but let them subject themselves just as the law also says. I don't follow the Torah when it comes to the behavior of women in the local, local synagogue or church. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. Now, what if they don't have a husband? 
and um, for it's improper for a woman to speak in church. I expect women to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be speaking in tongues, to be prophesying, to be praying for other people. I expect women to be operating in the gifts of the Spirit. So then it goes right to verse 36. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? Radically change in the subject. Nothing to do with women. So Gordon Fee, and I could see his point pretty vividly here, um, believes this is a gloss. And uh, whether we do or we don't, let's just be careful how much emphasis we put on this. And for me as a pastor, I de-emphasize this. And that would be my answer for anyone. I'm not saying women and men are identical and their roles are identical. I'm not saying oh, there's other passage that define things. But this particular passage, I wouldn't put weight on. I wouldn't put all my weight on this. And I know for some of you who are newer believers, this might come as a shock that the Bible didn't simply fall from heaven like the King James or the New American just fall from heaven right into our lap. No, there's a, there was a real process that went on. And um, we use our scholars. And it's important. The Bible says that God gave teachers to figure these things out and come to come to very good conclusions. So that's my conclusion there. So I would say for the women in my church here that I pastor, it's really our church. Go ahead and be filled with the Spirit, speak in tongues, prophesy, operate in the gifts. I think you can feel very free to put, to let chapters 12, 13, and 14 fully um, come into your heart as a woman as much as a man would and operate in this way. So... That's that. <laughs> That's my stand on that. And uh, this is a rare thing for me to say. Part of the scripture seems to me to be a gloss. And I don't do that lightly. But I have it with Gordon Fee's backing. And he explains it. And, and it's way too much for us to understand. Um, but uh, I understand it. And so that's what I'm saying here. All right. I think we might have some things to talk about in the breakout room. <laughs> so, Bob, close us in prayer here, and we'll switch over there. Uh, Father, we thank you for instructions of the Spirit. Yes. We thank you for spiritual gifts that we can operate, and we pray you bless the body of Christ and help us in the church to do th things decently and in order that God may be glorified and the lost hear the word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Nice being together. If you're watching this later in the day, we're glad you're with us and we love you. And we're going to go to the breakout room. That means we leave everybody else behind. Sorry about that. But um, we're going to go and have a discussion there, which is not recorded. So I'm not. Blessings to you all as we transition over. God bless you.